The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I'm Maura Ahrens Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. Each episode, we look at stories from business leaders who have dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they picked themselves up, and how they hope workplaces can change in the future. For the next two episodes, we're going to focus on managing anxiety through career transitions, whether it means quitting, getting fired, getting promoted, or leaving a job you love because it's time. And that means looking at the tough work you should do before the big transition. The hard art of learning to understand your feelings, because doing that will help you manage through whatever transition comes your way. More on taking time off work next week when we speak to Alyssa Mastromonaco, who was a veteran of the Obama administration. But first this week, we have Jerry Colonna, who is a sort of legendary CEO coach, former venture capitalist, and a very wise person. There's a little voice in our head that says, we know that this is coming from this shadow place. We know that this is coming from this sort of place of unresolved business, but we pretend it's not. Jerry argues that a lot of the adult leadership management career problems that we face anxiety, avoidance, impulsivity, denial, and sometimes things like drinking or drug abuse, anger, and toxic work relationships spring from our fundamental childhood experiences. And that while we might be able to build powerful careers while engaging in these bad actions, and we've all known people who've done it, understanding how your childhood shaped the adult you became and facing your demons is vital for anyone who truly wants to thrive in the next step of their career. He calls it growing up. A huge theme of your work, Jerry, is how we as leaders reconcile our grown, fancy, accomplished selves with our often wounded inner children. And I'm curious how you discovered this, although certainly other professionals have, have written at length about, about our inner child and the role of our childhood and our grown-upness. But it seems to me you're the first person I've read who has matched our leadership journey so explicitly with our childhood experiences. How did you, why and how did you discover this and why is this one of the things you emphasize? I think the how came about looking outward and looking inward at the same time. That is, observing, using my prodigious hypervigilant skills that I developed as a child to stay safe while simultaneously being well-guided in a process of my own self-discovery. I don't see what I've done as particularly unique. I actually see it as quite logical. <laughs> um, it and is. It, it's that bit that says not only is there a linkage between the unresolved, uh, unsorted baggage, to use a a line from Bruce Springsteen, the unsorted baggage of our childhood and our leadership challenges, but to flip that around and say, wait a minute, there's an opportunity that since being a good leader is so difficult, why not use that to do this work that you need to do anyway? that most of us avoid doing anyway. I happen, because of the Venn diagram of my odd life, have experience in the realm of organizations and experience in the realm of the heart. And the two, in my mind, overlap quite logically and obviously in that realm of leadership. Was there a moment when you realized in your life oh my God, I'm acting out a lot of trauma from my childhood. I need to look at this more closely. Was it ever that clear? (laughs) 
were there moments <laughs> <laughs> or what was the first moment <laughs> oh i don't even recall the first moment i mean recall that i've spent 30 years in psychoanalysis <laughs> that's <laughs> a lot that's a lot of so, hours yeah so uh, you know and can i reframe the question this way please were there moments when uh, my ability to pretend that I was no longer acting, that I was acting out, was no longer possible? Mm. Yeah. Like what? Because I suspect this is true for a number of people. There's a little voice in our head that says, we know that this is coming from this shadow place. We know that this is coming from this sort of place of unresolved business. But we pretend it's not. And that's the interesting moment is that when you finally get past the shame and the guilt that prevents you from recognizing that your past is present and you start to realize that we're all walking around with the past invading the present, well, then there's a relief that can come in. And that relief sort of shows up as, oh, it's okay. Hmm. What are some specific ways that you think trauma or, or bad models from our childhood imprint on how we lead in adults? Yeah, and, and if we can reframe the question just a little bit to, to wounds versus trauma, because trauma is a very, very specific word. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, the truth is we are all wounded, mm -hmm. even if we haven't experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. One expression of that is the notion of a parent or a significant caregiver who has been either absent or disappeared. Mm. And one of the consequences of, of that can be what my colleague Khaled Halim often refers to as early promotion. And so what happens within a family structure is that the child assumes responsibility for the emotional, if not physical, well-being of others in the family, either siblings or the, the remaining caregiver or parent, one of the attributes of that can be early lessons in being the caring leader, the one who is responsible for everybody. This is a really important message. These wounds don't necessarily result in, in only negative behaviors, right? Like, say, conflict avoidance as a result of growing up with violence. But they result oftentimes in very, very powerful positive experiences, such as the ability to step into uncertain situations and to craft a vision and a way to be. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a very useful tool for a child who, say, is 10 years old and has a parent who suddenly dies in a plane crash, for example, as one client of mine did, or had. Mm -hmm. And the result was that they had they, they had the inner resources to be able to withstand those shocks because they've already experienced them. Can you talk about the greedy CEO? Or sorry, the greedy salesperson a little bit. Um <laughs> <laughs> sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. In the in the book, um, I tell about how um a client came to one of our boot camps, and um, the first night of the boot camp, sometimes people accuse me of being woo woo. So it was a little <laughs> woo woo, and I'm reading poetry, and I, I'm no doubt walking around without shoes on. I may or may not have had socks on. It sort of depends on the day. <laughs> and um, he is getting visibly upset. He's a CEO of a relatively large and fast-growing company. And at one point, he bursts out. And he says, why the hell are we reading poetry? This is not why I spent all this money. I came here to be a better CEO. I came here because I have a greedy SOB head of sales, and I don't know what to do with him. I said, you stay. And if at the end of the weekend, you don't know what to do with this greedy SOB, I'll give you your money back. He ended up staying. And two days go by, and uh, by that point, we start exploring the, the Jungian notion of the shadow, the parts of ourselves, positive and negative, that for a whole variety of reasons we deny actually exists. And we place it, as Carl Jung said, in the shadow behind us. And it just starts to act out and it starts to show up. And uh, at one point, 
I ask him to tell me a story, tell me a story about shame. Because shame is a really in- interesting indicator. And if you can create these conditions in which people can open up and speak to the things, the shameful parts of them, there's gold. Mm. And he tells a story of being a young man and, and running away from an abusive home situation and becoming addicted to alcohol and homeless. And just following an intuition, I asked him, I said something like, uh, tell me about the night. <laughs> and he said, he just starts crying and he feels a little shaky because he's been seen. And I said, and he goes on to tell me about the promise he's made to himself that he would never be hungry again. <laughs> what I invite him to see was that, that that promise he made to himself, when denied, mm-hmm. became manifested in a kind of greed. Mm. Because what is greed but the wish to be to have all the toys to feel safe? Right? Scrooge if it's McDuck all, on his piles of gold Scrooge coins. Scrooge McDuck is all he's trying to do is ward off poverty. Mm-hmm. But the problem for him as a CEO was that by denying that that was operating, he had figured out a way to, as I often say, outsource his greed, right? And the key point was to ask him, well, who hired the guy in the first place? Well, he did. (laughs) Did you know that he was greedy? Well, of course. The problem was he wanted that guy to carry all of his negative feelings about that wish while he retained the positive feelings. Jerry, are you an anxious person? Do you have anxiety? Oh, sure. <laughs> what kind and how? <laughs> <laughs> what flavor? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, part of my continual work in progress is that um, as a child, uh, the way uh, anger was was worked with within my family system was that it was either outwardly expressed with a kind of violence, either mm. implicit or explicit. Or it was internalized as a kind of uh, safer way of expressing it, and either in a self-criticism or, more often in my case, just a general anxiety. So it was just safer to feel fear, mm. but the thing that will often set me off more than anything is, is uh, conflict. So if two people that I love are in conflict, then... At one level, the fear is that they're going to hurt each other, but at another level, the fear is they're going to hurt me, Hmm. right? Because it's always going to end up in a fight, as my father used to say. It always ends up in a fight. (laughs) Now, I will tell, I will say to you that, um, you know, you asked, "Am I anxious?" Of course, I'm anxious. I'm human. (laughs) (laughs) Just like, do I do I experience anger? Of course, I do. I'm human. But what is different for me now? Uh, than has ever been before in my life is that my skills with working with those feelings are so much higher than they were before. And, and I, I, I can experience anxiety knowing that the anxiety will end. I want to I talk about hypervigilance. I think that this is something that people who are achievers, <laughs> we may share in common, yeah. but talk about too little. I mean, I was extremely hypervigilant in my childhood. I still am. It seems like from what I've read in your writing that you you are hypervigilant. You cherish those gifts, but uh, it's your superpower, I think you even say. But you also know that it can it can distract you. It can make you extremely anxious. Can you talk about your journey with your hypervigilance a little bit? Sure. And and I think you're wisely making a connection between a kind of perfectionism and a hypervigilance. That's right. And 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 I define hypervigilance as the capacity to or the tendency to be hyper aware of every shift, uh, especially in the emotional uh subplot of whatever organization and grouping of people we have. And for me, my hypervigilance really was established in response to my parents. My dad who was alcoholic and my mom who was mentally ill. And taking on, <coughs> excuse me, as children will often do, taking on this sort of magical thinking belief system that my responsibility was 
to get everything right to make sure that dad would not be drunk hmm. and that mom would not have um, a delusionary outburst, which was one of the ways her mental illness uh, manifested. She might go off into the corner and rant, you know, to, you know, a dead politician like Bobby Kennedy. And she'd have a conversation with him and we'd all be sitting there terrified because Bobby Kennedy is not in the room. And so I, I do describe that as a, as a kind of superpower because the way, you know, my first job as, as an adult was as a reporter. And it actually served me really, really well because I would often hear things that the person that I was interviewing themselves weren't even hearing. And I could play that back in a question. It's a superpower because all of a sudden I could step into an empathetic stance. And instead of me being the interviewee and you being the interviewer, we get to have an emotionally intimate conversation and we get to be human beings together because I notice. The negative side of it is that um, I will drive life and business partners crazy because I will say, well, wait a minute, you said the word red when really you meant burnt orange, didn't you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and it's like, it can turn into kind of a hyper factualism and almost when it's at its worst expression, especially when anger is kind of denied, mm -hmm. then it becomes a kind of prosecutorial vigilance. Is micromanaging uh, hypervigilance? Is it another word? Uh, I think it's probably as – it is probably hypervigilance, but it's probably hypervigilance ma uh, married to the thing that you said before, this perfectionism. Yeah. Which is if the thing is marginally out of alignment, if things are just marginally off, then chaos is going to ensue. Uh, micromanagement as a coach, when I work in an organization, if I see micromanagement as a predominant cultural attribute – Mm -hmm. chances are there's a tremendous amount of fear. Mm. I think that the most hypervigilant, micromanaging, perfectionist people make themselves feel awful. And oftentimes the threat is a um, misreading of the situation uh, filtered through the lens of the past. So whether that lens of the past is conscious or unconscious, right? It could be an Excel That's spreadsheet right. with, with numbers for the quarter, but That's right. how is that informed by the past? Well, uh, there's a Buddhist story, um, and I, I'll mangle the story, but of a man who spends his entire evening sleepless because he's convinced that there's a coil in the corner of the room that's a snake, only to wake up and realize in the morning that it's a rope, <laughs> right? Now, there's a wisdom in pointing out that, because I think many, many times we live like that, and many business people will live in that experience. But what is often l lost in looking at the wisdom of that is a very, very important lesson from childhood, which is it's better to be safe than sorry. And so what I like to do, what I like to recommend as a coach is to work with someone and, and, and to help them appreciate the wonderful survival strategy that was hypervigilance and fear and the strive for achieving. And then to really ask oneself, does one really need to worry about whether or not you're safe than sorry? Is the threat that you once experienced as a child still present? Chances are the programming's still present, but the threats are different. And the quickest way to understand that the threat has changed is that the amount of power that we have as adults is vastly different than the power we had as children. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Imagine that I'm, I'm that person and I've done so well and I'm such a good worker and 
I'm going to get promoted. And my fear of finally being revealed for the person who probably won't catch the mistake next time or is really just a big ball of shame that, you know, I work so hard to hide is actually holding me back from taking that leap. What do I tell myself? Well, there's a bunch of of questions that might occur to me as a coach. I might ask that person to consider what would it feel like in their body to no longer worry about being found out as a fraud. We often will feel something in our body before our mind, our conscious mind is able to discern. So how would it feel in my body enables me to envision having a different relationship with that emotional thought, with that feeling. Like when I realized that being anxious kept me safe from being angry, I got to say thank you to that little jujitsu move that I used to do because, oh, it kept me safe. Yay. I feel like I want to have an Oprah moment and repeat what you just said. Being anxious kept you from being angry. Yeah. Or it kept me safe. Safe from being being angry. angry. So are you angry now when you need to be? Uh, Yeah. One of the moves that I made, I you know, I often make references to superpowers and Marvel comics and DC comics. <clears throat> and so I fixate on the Hulk as a beautiful expression of that anger. And in one of the early Avengers movies, uh, Mark Ruffalo playing Bruce Banner envisions being locked in a subway car, crowded people, don't put me in. It's like, that's not a good thing, right? I like thinking about the Hulk, and I think that the move that I've tried to make is not to shut Hulk up behind a cloud of anxiety, (laughs) but to actually turn Hulk into Thor. My son would love that. (laughs) Well, Hulk into Thor. So what's the difference? The two of them, the reason that, that mythologically they put them into battle in the comic books is that they're actually two sides of the same coin. But Thor has purpose and his purpose is social justice. And so when I can connect to the purpose, to justice, I can feel really, really solid and comfortable in my anger because the anger is no longer threatening to be out of control the way Hulk is. It makes me angry to think of how often business leaders and those who hold power misuse that power and abuse the power and do harm and violence to the world around them. Physical world, the the planet, the communities, it makes me angry. Now, I can get up on a soapbox and yell and scream and maybe even punch something, or I can become Thor and double down and work my tail off to make the world safe for human beings. I'd much rather be that other person. But Jerry, can you be an anxious warrior? Because because I, I relate to that, but part of me is like, mm, I would be an anxious warrior. Are you asking, can you be an anxious warrior? Or are you asking, can you be, a, it, is a warrior unafraid? Oh, right. Or what does a warrior do with, with her fear? Ah, <laughs> yeah, see, see, warriors are not unafraid. A warrior acknowledges there's a wisdom in the fear. Fear is the wish to keep you safe. It's reckless and foolhardy to deny fear. The strength comes when we choose to act in the face of fear. Here's a true threat in work. Companies may fail. That's a true threat. You may be fired. That's a true threat. Remember the story, in the, the, the book I tell about Chad Dickerson? I was just going to ask Singer. you actually to tell that. Yes. Yeah. 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 So I tell the story of one, uh, one of my former clients, Chad Dickerson, who is uh, formerly CEO at Etsy. And um, I tell the story of, uh, of he and I sitting on the rooftop of Etsy's building the night before he's announcing that he's been fired. And the 
powerful moment was the realization that there was a, a man who could have chosen to slink away, could have chosen to basically, you know, hide behind the, I'm going to resign because I'm going to spend more time with my family, but instead went to a very fearful declaration. I have been fired. And in doing so, owned it and snatched from that moment his own grace and dignity. Now, that's not to say it wasn't painful. It was incredibly painful. And it's not to say it didn't cause all sorts of self-doubt. Of course it caused all sorts of self-doubt. And to our point, he was afraid. What am I going to do? How are people going to view me? Right? The, it's a, the, the fear was based on an existential threat. How would I be perceived? It was fear of shame. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's amazing. And the Etsy office in Dumbo is the coolest office I've ever been to. I will <laughs> say that. It's amazing. But you have a great quote in the book, which I can actually hear my father saying. I think it's the higher up the pole the monkey climbs, the more his ass shows. <laughs> <laughs> and I can imagine listeners saying, okay, fine, that's one thing for the CEO of Etsy, like that's a cool company and he was the CEO and he was a big deal, he was going to be fine. But if I did something like that, I would be exposed and my life would be over as I know it. Right. And I, I want to acknowledge something that as a white cisgendered male, mm -hmm. it may even be easier for me than it might be for someone who identifies in other social locations. Yes. Th that is a truth. There's nothing I can do about that. But what I can say is um, there are all truisms about um, the degree to which we let the world change our internal sense of self. Hmm. And the greatest strength, the greatest dignity comes from the internal knowing of our own self-worth. That is the greatest uh, source of risk. It's the thing that gets attacked. And it's, it's the place from which the warrior springs. It's, I know I have failed to live up to the aspirations that I hold to myself every day. I fail every day. But I will get up tomorrow and I will try again regardless of what the external world thinks of me. It took me a long time to grow up in that way. But I think that that's the opportunity that leadership presents for us. Can we grow to that point? And I am not my job and I am not what other people. Amen. I want you to talk to the listener, and I include myself, who is obsessed with creating enough money for themselves because of a childhood experience or who knows. The anxiety around money, I think, keeps many of us trapped. And um, one of the things that you talk about in the book is how to deal with our anxiety and our historical set of sort of anxiety around money. I'm curious, either if you have an aha moment about how your childhood fear of being poor was holding you back, or if there's a story of someone you've worked with who realized that their money anxiety was affecting them or limiting them in a certain way? Sure. In the book, I tell the story of my grandparents' home, my mother's parents' home, Dominic and Nicoletta Guido in Brooklyn. And Dominic Guido was an ice man. Um, so he was one of the first entrepreneurs I ever met, and self taught sixth grade education. Dominic and Nicoletta's, uh, Guido's home was always appeal, felt to me like a bastion of calm in a very chaotic childhood. And my younger brother, John, and I would often spend nights with my grandparents, especially when mom was in psychiatric hospitals. Um, the kids would be parceled out. So we'd spent a lot of time there. And um, grandpa like lemon drops and in the pantry of their house uh, there was always a tin canister of lemon drops and i always associated uh having enough lemon drops with having enough money to feel safe and calm the the realization for me 
uh, came about that there was this there that there was this relationship between the pursuit of money, which was really a pursuit of lemon drops, which was really a pursuit for safety. The realization came to me um, after some particularly challenging times in my thirties when I was financially successful and still not feeling safe where the inner part of me was not matching the outer part of me and where I was finding myself pursuing a life as a venture capitalist. And the moment came when, when my infamous Dr. Sayers, my analyst, uh, in a kind of bit of her own frustration said, how much is enough, Jerry? And I found myself exasperated and saying, Bill Gates. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, I, I need to have as much as Bill Gates. And when I heard myself say that out loud, I began to realize that I was chasing a, a phantasmagoric ghost that has nothing to do with the reality of whether or not I, in fact, had enough already. Right, And so no amount of financial uh, uh, accumulation was going to make me feel safe until I understood of what, what it was that I was truly looking for. And what I was truly looking for was the feeling of going into the pantry, reaching into the tin canister, and always knowing that there were lemon drops in there. That's it for this week's show. If you like what you've heard, be sure to subscribe and submit a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. And if you have an idea for the show or you want to tell us your story, drop me a note at anxiousachiever at gmail.com or you can tweet me at Mora A.M. That's M-O-R-R-A-A-M. Special thanks to the team at Harvard Business Review, my producer Mary Dew, the team at Podcast Garage, and all of our guests who are telling us their stories from the heart. From the HBR Presents Network, I'm Maura Ahrens-Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. <laughs>